Hello, I'm Wakar Rizvi and this is Scope. As OPEC members meet in Vienna today, there are a number of factors on the agenda. The biggest would be Qatar's shock announcement that it is leaving OPEC. To add to that is a possible agreement between Saudi Arabia and Russia over oil production cuts in order to bring up prices, no doubt to the annoyance of Trump. Now, before we get to our guest who is joining us for this discussion, I'd like to show just a few charts that put into context the discussion that we're going to have going forward in this program. The first chart is about oil prices and how they have moved from 2014 to 2018. You can see there the variation in the prices of oil throughout these four years. Uh, our next chart is also just as important, and that is about the top 10 oil producing countries. Of course, this is very important uh, to put in context what Qatar's exit from OPEC means, as well as the fact that we may possibly have the, this agreement between Russia and the Saudis over oil production cut. And just to put that in context for our viewers. Now, let me introduce our guest who is joining us to discuss this issue further. We're, of course, going to have other guests joining us as well later on. We're joined by Dr. Manu Takin, who is an oil and energy consultant, and he is joining us live now from London. Dr. Takin, thanks very much for joining us in the scope. Pleasure. Uh, uh, Dr. Takin, you know, one of, the, one of the major issues, obviously, as you know, in the lead up to this Vienna summit for OPEC was that of Qatar. Uh, what do you make of that? Well, the, um, the, the current uh, today's meeting, the OPEC ministerial conference, was planned a long time ago. Uh, it was not because of the uh, Qatari uh, decision. But Qatar unexpectedly a few days ago decided and announced that it is going to leave uh, the organization. And I have uh, read and discussed so much, I have heard views uh, giving explanation why Qatar left. And I think I'm not convinced there is no reason why officially his Excellency <clears throat> Al Kabi, the uh, Qatari minister, explained that they have, uh, they want to put all their efforts and resources on their their other resource, which is natural gas and the export facilities as a liquefied natural gas, which is one of the largest or the largest in the world, and they have planned now to expand it from the 77 million tons per year uh, LNG production to 110. So he said that the efforts uh, and executive uh, power, individuals, uh, resources within mm -hmm. Qatar are going to be concentrating more on gas and the less oil, because less is uh, oil is uh, has less significant. Uh, uh, but to me, I don't think that is an, a good explanation. I don't know. Some other people explain it as a political, because there's a standoff. Yeah. an embargo by Saudi Arabia against Qatar, that Qatar now wants to stand and say there is no use being in this uh, club of OPEC and discussing it when Saudi Arabia twists everybody's arms and so on. But I don't think that is uh, also <laughs> an explanation. And there are other explanations. I don't want to go on. Yeah, uh, but I leave it back to you. It is, okay, a, it you know, is I, a question. I, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying there. So let's talk for a moment, if we can, then, Dr. Thakin, about the effect that this will have on OPEC. Uh, to be fair, and, and as the chart we showed earlier showed, Qatar uh, was 2%, I believe, of OPEC output total, uh, is 2% of OPEC output. It's still part of OPEC till January, I believe. Uh, it's not going to have a huge effect on OPEC, will it? Well, on a vol volume, um, as you mentioned, ratio, the proportion of Qatari oil production compared with the rest of OPEC, 32 million and then 600, 650,000. Yeah. Of course, it's not volume-wise uh, volume that significant. But organization of uh, OPEC, uh, oil and exporting countries, OPEC, is a voluntary organization. It is uh, not a cartel of oil made major oil companies, commercial companies. It's a group mm -hmm. of governments get together to defend oil, which is their main source of revenue. They are uh, exporters of uh, economies rely on single commodity export. Mm -hmm. So when they get together, it is not the fact that Saudi Arabia is strong and Qatar is weak. No, all the ministers get together, they put politics aside, and then they are all in the same boat, whether a small ex volume oil exporter or a large volume oil exporter. If the price of oil is higher, they will all benefit. Of course, this is not as simple that high price is good and low price is bad, because mm. over years and decades, 
uh, or the OPEC countries are now aware that if the price is too high, they will shoot themselves in the foot. In other words, there will be other uh, areas which were too expensive to produce oil would now become economic and commercial, as has happened before. So they uh, try to see what is a, a real reasonable price considering the cost of production, global economy. They also look at the future mm. uh, in the next six months before their next meeting, that is the world, the economy going to grow? Would it require oil? And then they balance this uh, status of demand expectation with the uh, uh, supply from outside OPEC. And then they say, OK, out of this, how much we right. as a group uh, would be producing? You know, it's, it's a complicated story. I think I'm saying a little bit detailed because this is what the ministers discuss and before mm. the week before their technical advisors all meet and then the minister deputy ministers and so on and at these meetings they are all equal they all listen to each other but, but to be not- fair dr thakin I, I imagine many would argue that uh, let's let's be honest here the saudis are the leading exporter of oil um the saudis right now and i'm po- talking politics here are under pressure by the trump administration to keep oil prices down as you well know of course so um what's to say that that political Political pressure isn't working, and and is there an argument to be made? Then, do you think that uh, not just the Saudis, but the major oil exporters, possibly do have too much control over the decision making of this organization? Well, it has always. It is natural that although they sit equally around the table and they discuss the bargaining power of the member country, which has the largest export volume, is is definitely more effective. But through the whole history of uh, OPEC since 1960, when it was established, this situation has always been there. But they have always reached a compromise. They have analyzed it. Uh, if if Saudi Arabia in the last six months have uh, not uh, has not observed the discipline so mm. the discipline that the ministers agreed among themselves saudi arabia has been producing about more than a million because it's about 10 was the volume which they had agreed right. uh, two years ago a year and a half ago now saudi arabia is producing more than 11. so this uh, lack of observance which as you explained could be and probably is due to the pressure from the united states and this crisis in the unfortunate uh, incident of, of a murder of a journalist, the world opinion. And so all these things are definitely there. But there have been other countries in the history of, of OPEC that they have done such as this lack of discipline, trying to produce more without the rest recognizing the so-called the impolite way of cheating and so on through the history of OPEC. Venezuela for four years in the 1990s did produce more than its quota and it had reached about 900,000 barrels per day. And the minister used to deny it, whereas the minister of oil minister of Venezuela would deny it, mm-hmm. whereas the uh, minister of finance of Venezuela in its report said that they were exporting sack. So all these things were discussed. These contradictions that we now are looking uh, and say, oh, it is uh, serious, which is serious, has mm-hmm. been in the past. And they always reach a compromise because at the end it's what is good for all of them. It is good to be member of a club and challenge and discuss rather than leaving it completely in the hands of the more influential member. Okay, that, that's a fair point, but then, you know, many people, as you well know, Dr. Keen, are now talking about the other countries which really need oil. And obviously, as you said, high oil prices are good for, in, in general terms, speaking about all these members because they'll make more money. But the likes of Iran, for example, which argues, um, you know, Bijan Namdar Zangari, the Iranian oil minister, has argued that. Iran, while under sanctions, will want its output uh, to remain and or to increase uh, so that it's able to offset at least somewhat uh, those effects. Iraq has to has to rebuild itself and needs um, to be selling oil to a certain extent to be able to rebuild the country. Uh, What do you make of those arguments? How do you think and do you think it's possible for OPEC to compromise on those two countries and others? Oh, uh, such arguments which seem uh, insoluble and real challenges, I repeat, have been also in the past. Uh, uh, Iraq was for two years, uh, two decades under sanctions. And so uh, the ministers allowed Iraq to export as much as it could under Saddam Hussein and afterwards uh, when he fell to allow Iraq to build up. And 
similar cases have existed in Nigeria and Libya have suffered because of domestic problems, lack of security, and then they were allowed to produce more. Mm. So when they sit together, it is a compromise, give and take, is a horse trading to speak as such. In fact, in the 1980 to 85, which the crisis, there was a major serious problem in the world oil price uh, and supply and demand balance. Uh, the minister sat 10 days in, in, uh, in, in the meeting in London. And at the end, this is a, a story just to give you the picture mm. for your listeners and viewers. At the end, the, His Excellency Lohman was the Nigerian oil minister, the president of the ministerial conference. He asked all the advisors of ministers to leave. And then he closed the door and said, your excellencies, this is the table. Let us reach an agreement how much each country should produce. And they separated, divided it among themselves as the so-called quota for each member. So these things have existed in the past. And uh, uh, what the, the today's meeting will also have the same story. In fact, I think the situation is better because in the in those days it was only OPEC who was trying to balance as an organization it, the supply and demand of oil in the world. Now, in the last year and a half, two mm -hmm. years, we have non-OPEC countries: Russia, Oman, and others, Mexico, uh, who have joined. So it is a, a group with so many hands in. It is uh, easier to. Sort of uh, bear the, the, the heavy weight uh, of how to manage supply. Of course, as you mentioned, I yeah. repeat, I do agree. Politics, the pressure by President Trump on Saudi Arabia is obliterating all this. And it is a fine balance, give and take. Behind doors, when without the press, the ministers sit together and discuss. And they have, in fact, official announcement by His uh, uh, Excellency the Saudi minister is that there has to be a reduction. Mm -hmm. So Technical side, the ministers would want to reduce. Political side, the government, as was in the, in the previous decades, also that the king would tell the minister to increase, and the minister would uh, try to resist. This is uh, in the previous decades, right. Saudi Arabia. So, so let's, let's, so the talk, same let's talk about are there. If, if we may, Doctor Tegan, because you because you mentioned the Saudis and the Russians as well. So I wanted to I wanted to bring that to the fore then, because we've heard a lot about that before going into this Vienna meeting. We know that tomorrow, I believe it is, that the, the Saudis and the Russians will meet and there may be uh, some sort of an agreement on a production cut, um, which the Russians will also adhere to, apparently. Do you think that that agreement will come to the fore? Because the Russians, just till a few days ago, seemed quite optimistic. Uh, the Saudis have been cautious about this. And as you know, uh, Donald Trump just tweeted um, before this Vienna summit started saying that he wants OPEC to keep production uh, to such an extent where low prices remain? Yes. Well, my guess is that I think they will uh, cut the, 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 the supplies. This arm fisting and pressure by United States, not new. When President Clinton was in, in office and oil prices collapsed, his uh, secretary uh, of, of energy, he, I, quite openly, he traveled around and lobbied OPEC mm -hmm. countries and visited them before their meetings and so on and so forth. Uh, at the end, it is a compromise, it is a political decision. So they have to probably say yes, we are cutting so much officially and then unofficially cut uh, afterwards, cut more and so on. There are different ways and means. But you ask me my uh, guess, I wouldn't say my forecast, but difficult to forecast. Mm -hmm. My guess, it will be that there will be some announcement of a reduction in supply. You see, supply demand balance as 2018, the demand for OPEC was less than 2017 and 2019 supply demand balance forecasts mm. showed that the, the world would require less oil from uh, OPEC as an organization. So there is excess supply. And mm. as a forecast for the next six months, one year, again, there will be excess supply. So this is well understood on a technical side by all sides. And the, uh, on the best, the only way, they can't just forget about it. They have to reduce supply. And as to how much, and they would announce something, maybe less about the amount that they are going mm -hmm. to cut, but they might quietly cut more. Saudi Arabia might not reduce that much later on. These things could happen, I, one can uh, mm. uh, speculate, you see. But I think there will be some announcement on reduction in spite of the United States pressure. But of course, 
politics is very influential and we have to wait and see and I'm not a political uh, uh, understood understood so so let's talk for a moment then about a lot of the alarm that experts have been raising now that Qatar has decided to leave or has announced that it will be leaving uh, you may have read a lot of those articles online by a lot of experts oil experts who are saying that uh, Qatar is leaving may create a precedent of sorts for other members and I mentioned Iraq earlier because I wanted to come to this question at some point and that is that some people are saying that uh, Iraq may leave OPEC at some point in time. Do you think that's a very alarmist, fatalistic way of looking at things? Or do you think that Iraq may feel it needs to leave simply because it needs to be making um, enough money to be able to rebuild itself? Or do you think that those realities on the ground will be understood by OPEC? I think in, <clears throat> the realities are understood by OPEC. And I doubt if the uh, departure of Qatar would to start a chain of departure by other members, as some analysts have been saying. No, definitely not. Uh, OPEC, as an organization of the members, they see that they are all in the same boat. If I leave, the other one leaves, and then they will lose. Because if oil price falls, the revenue by those countries <clears throat> will be less. Being outside OPEC, they might not have that much limitation of quota, the reduction that they are might decide they might <clears throat> produce more but when the price falls that extra production might not compensate for it so at the end that they would realize that and as for a chain reaction i don't think so and as for other mem uh, opec members leaving it is not new mm. ecuador indonesia gabon and so on in the in the history of opec uh, left on those days it wasn't because of politics as we speculate now it mm. was because they were not exporting countries the, the, the oil export was not significant for them. Indonesia was an importer. And so they left because technically they were not a major exporter. Uh, Rata, uh, sorry, uh, Ecuador and Gabon left because they thought, well, they are small producers, as some people are arguing, and in the negotiations, they may not have much influence, they left. But later on, although the production has in, had not increased, they felt that it's better to be in the club and have a say and argue. And so they joined again. So countries leaving and come, and new members, Angola and other countries, have joined OPEC in the last few years. So I, I think we should not make a big story out of uh, Qatar leaving. Okay. Uh, I would say that Qatar, uh, OPEC will be sorry as a member, uh, as a fa that a family member is departing. You see, all the OPEC experts, the deputy ministers, technical committees have been working together all the member countries of OPEC and those uh, representatives and experts from Qatar for so many years. They know each other, they discuss mm -hmm. technical issues, mm -hmm. and on the political side as well, they sit on the oil politics, I mean. And it would be pity if a member of the family leaves. But okay. the, 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 it will continue, and hopefully Qatar might come back. I don't know the domestic priorities and strategies within the Qatari state, right. and, uh, but it might change in the, in the coming years. They might come back. Okay, uh, let's just take a quick break. Uh, before going to that break, I just wanted to review what Dr. Takina has so far said, and it's, it's important, uh, as he said, to, to view uh, OPEC as possibly just a family, and this is just a decision which, which Qatar has made at, at f looking at its own domestic um, issues, possibly, and or its, its um, you know, low influence within OPEC, possibly because of its low output in comparison to, to huge exporters such as Saudi Arabia. We'll discuss this a lot further coming back after this break. Stay with us. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're continuing to discuss um, the OPEC summit that's happening today in Vienna, as well as Qatar leaving OPEC and many other related issues to that. We're joined now by Michael Arnold, who is the deputy, who is the deputy researcher, I should say, at TRT World's Research Center, and he's joining us live now by Skype from Istanbul. Michael, thanks for joining us. Uh, um, there's a lot to talk about, obviously, Michael, but let's start with the basics. Uh, we know that a few days uh, before this summit took place, or is taking place, I should say, in Vienna, Qatar announced that it would be leaving OPEC. Uh, what did you make of that announcement and its impact? Well, I think uh, there's a couple of things that are very important here to kind of get a, to put it in perspective. Um, I think we need to keep uh, keep it in light of the geopolitical situation currently in the region, um, namely that Qatar has lost confidence uh, in its neighbors, particularly uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, given the blockade and various other uh, events that have taken place. 
Uh, and secondly, that this represents a larger strategic shift where Qatar is moving away uh, from the sort of GCC uh, alignment uh, and is doing so with confidence. So by making this announcement, um, it is showing that it is confident in, in moving away from what may have been its uh, traditional relations in the region. But does this have a negative impact on OPEC itself? And in and, and this point, I'm specific, specifically speaking about, obviously, output. Because when we look at, at the beginning of this program, we showed a, a chart where it showed output of different countries, oil output, that is. And Qatar is quite low in that list, 2%, I believe, of OPEC output. So this doesn't really hurt OPEC at all, right? It's more just symbolic, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. I think that's a very good point. Uh, and I'll also add to that, I don't think it hurts uh, it doesn't hurt OPEC, nor does it hurt Qatar. Uh, you're absolutely correct. I mean, Qatar is less than 2% of output uh, in terms of uh, oil production, uh, 600,000 barrels a day. There are uh, corporations in the United States that are producing more than that. So it's, it's definitely uh, uh, symbolic on one hand. Um, and it also extends, though, to, to Qatar's uh, focus on, on natural gas production and on increasing, uh, increasing that capacity as well, which is something that is going to be very important for, uh, for Qatar moving forward and something that they recognize will be uh, very important for world energy needs moving forward. Uh, by 2030, for example, uh, natural gas is expected to, to account for uh, or provide for, sorry, 25 to 30 percent of the world's ener energy needs. So, so this is also, uh, you know, a strategic move by Qatar on, uh, on the economic front as well. But to your first point, absolutely, it's it's not going to impact OPEC economically, uh, nor will it be a, a sort of a painful economic uh, decision for Qatar as well. And, you know, there have be, been some fatalistic, if I may use that term, experts out there, and you know, they're being quite pessimistic about what kind of a precedent this sets for other OPEC members who may be looking at Qatar's example and saying, why not us too? Do we really gain as much as we've been told by OPEC? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite the example of Iraq, for example, which is a country that's been spoken about a number, in a number of articles by experts saying that Iraq obviously needs uh, high enough oil prices to be able to rebuild after years of war. Do you think there's an argument to be made that the likes of Iraq may be looking at Qatar and say, why not us? Why shouldn't we leave as well? That's a that's a possibility. Look, I think with with the OPEC issue, there's there's a number of things that may cause um, countries to reassess. So, I mean, firstly, Qatar is not the first uh, country to leave OPEC. Uh, other countries have left before. Some have rejoined, uh, but it's not uh, sort of precedent making in that respect. Uh, however, I think there seems to be uh, a building consensus that uh, which is reflected in the Qatari decision that OPEC is. Uh, increasingly being politicized, uh, particularly under the leadership of uh, Saudi Arabia's de facto leader, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, and I think this is something we saw very recently, for example, even with uh, American President Trump tweeting out that he thanks Saudi Arabia for, for lower, lowering oil prices, which sort of indicates the uh, type of raci relationality there, that the United States uh, president says that he wants lower oil prices. Yeah. Saudi Arabia pushes its uh, weight around in, in organizations like OPEC, and we have a drop in, in oil prices. Now, I realize the, the energy economy is not quite that simplistic, but there's a perception there that, that uh, indicates that there may be uh, uh, an increased politicization of, of OPEC as well. So it's possible that other OPEC members uh, may also see that and say, well, this, is, this relationship is no longer working for us. And so, you know, then there's the argument, obviously, as, as you brought up with the Saudis, uh, there is the argument that said that the Saudis simply um, have too much influence in OPEC. But then many others would argue that, listen, they, ha they are the leading exporter of oil. So it's natural that they would have more influence over an organization like OPEC. Uh, where, where do you lie when it comes to that argument? Do you think OPEC does need to reform itself? Well, I, I, think, I think it's definitely natural that they would have, uh, you know, an influence that uh, is appropriate to their, their weight in oil production. Um, however, like I mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the politicization of that weight uh, more than anything, I think, which is, is reflected in the Qatari's decision to, to withdraw from OPEC, indicating that for them it's, it's no longer a, uh, a, a relevant body. Um, in terms of whether OPEC needs to be reformed, I think this is uh, this is a separate question altogether. I mean, uh, 
growth in oil demand is uh, decreasing around the world, especially as compared to uh, demand for natural gas, for example. So, I mean, you could also see the Qatari decision in this regard as, as being very uh, forward, forward looking in that respect. So in terms of oil producers, I, you know, I think this is a, a discussion that, that they are having. I mean, we have uh, increased oil production coming out of a lot of non-OPEC members, whether it be uh, Russia, the United States, with the uh, increased oil output from fracking. Uh, so, I mean, OPEC still represents that sort of 45% of global oil output, but, but there's a possibility that that uh, market share could actually decrease as well. All right, so let's talk about the effects and the geopolitical effects of Qatar's announcement. Pretty much, I believe it was the next day itself, um, the Qatari Emir got an invitation by the Saudi king to attend the GCC summit. Uh, do you think that that was a direct effect, or many people, are, many others are saying that uh, we're reading too much into that? Yeah, I think that was probably something that was uh, in play prior to the announcement to withdraw from uh, OPEC. It's possible that the timing coming a day afterwards may have had some relation to it, but I wouldn't say it's uh, uh, it's directly related. But I think what remains to be seen, and this is is connected to to uh, Qatar's decision to leave OPEC, when we put it in the context of uh, of the geopolitics of the region, of what I mean, there's no doubt Qatar will send a delegation to uh, the GCC summit, but at what level? Uh, that remains to it remains an open question. And so then one, one wonders then, when one looks at the Saudi actions right now vis-a-vis -vis Qatar, A, uh, inviting it to the GCC summit, the king sending that letter to Qatar, and then secondly now working with the Russians as well uh, to possibly uh, cut production. I believe that meeting will take place tomorrow in Vienna. Uh, that again goes against what, what Donald Trump tweeted just recently, again demanding that OPEC keep prices low. So it, it's a bit of a shift, isn't it, in Saudi policies? policies? Well, I think uh, what our recent history has shown is that Saudi policies these days uh, are very much in flux, uh, particularly, again, under the, uh, the leadership or de facto leadership of Mohammed bin Salman uh, since, he, since 2015 at the, at the, uh, the earliest. Um, so this could also be in reaction to the perception uh, amongst his inner circle, for example, that uh, you know they have increased pressure coming on them from the United States. Uh, we have the Senate report and the press release that was released by uh, several prominent, prominent U.S. senators, uh, ostensibly related to the Hashemji affair, but also calling on uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, pull back from Yemen as it's hurting American interests, to uh, remove the blockade from Qatar, etc. So. I think at this point it's it's hard to predict uh, Saudi measures uh, under the current leadership um, because they seem so reactive to to everything that's going on. I think you know in that light it's also important to to remember that since uh, the Hashemji affair, uh, Saudi Arabia has been under constant international uh, pressure, both media and governmental, uh, which is for for uh, two months now, uh, and this is something that they have never experienced in their history. And so, you know, having policy shifts from the Saudis at this point, they may be scrambling a little bit to try to to find the to find some solid ground under their feet again. But, but just just looking at the, the 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 economic factor here, obviously, I imagine that the Saudis would say that obviously um, they would want higher oil prices too, wouldn't they? Because they make more money. And I know that's a very simplistic look again at at the the energy markets and the entire issue of oil. But but certainly that makes sense, doesn't it? That simply from the finances point of view. Um, the Saudis obviously want to make more money and do you think that that just means at this point that the Saudis may possibly just be po walking away from Trump to an extent, taking a step towards Russia, which would also, I imagine, trouble the U.S. establishment a bit? Uh, it's, I think it's a definite possibility. In terms of the higher oil prices, uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, you know, at a reasonably high level, Saudi Arabia makes more money, but they also have a uh, strategic relationship with the Americans to keep in mind. And I think this is something that is 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 unprecedented even within Saudi-U.S. relations is the uh, the. The, the personal level of relations between uh, the powers that be in both countries, where you have Donald Trump uh, and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, on the one hand, Mohammed bin Salman and his inner circle on the other. Um, and the relations almost have, have come at a more personal level than, than at uh, the larger state level. Again, I think you can see this reflected even in American politics, where you have 
officials from the CIA uh, leaking information to the American press uh, about Khashoggi, about Mohammed bin Salman, which is something that is, is, is really unprecedented. So, you know, I think it's, it's hard to kind of gauge that at this point. And then let's for a moment also look at, at other players here in this region. Of course, you're sitting in Turkey, so I want to I want to get your point of view of how Turkey may be viewing this entire situation vis-a-vis um, -vis Qatar leaving OPEC and otherwise the the ongoing um, what, what's called the Gulf crisis. Really, do you think that that countries such as Turkey are, are hoping for a resolution of this crisis uh, at some point soon? Um, so to answer your first question, I think. Uh, Turkey has not made any sort of significant statement on Qatar's uh, leaving OPEC, uh, which which makes sense because I don't think that particular thing is is much of an issue for them. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of resolving the Gulf crisis, uh, definitely, uh, I think you know all players in the region want to see some sort of res resolution to that. Uh, uh, to that crisis, but uh, we also have to keep in mind that at the beginning of that crisis, Turkey clearly put its uh, cards in the Qatari camp, um, and and uh, by many accounts, uh, saved the Qataris at least in the early days of the blockade from uh, from economic collapse. So. Turkey is, has a strategic relationship with Qatar, but Turkey is also concerned uh, with maintaining uh, good relations with, uh, with, with Saudi Arabia, which I think you know, we've seen that balance even within recent events in the region where uh, you know, Turkey has pressed the issue of uh, Khashoggi's killing, but has been very careful to, uh, for example, not implicate the Saudi king, to be very clear in their statement saying that, you know, we do not hold the, uh, the Saudi king responsible for this in an effort to kind of balance those relations and, and maintain uh, good ties. And then another issue, obviously, that comes up, especially when we're talking about oil and OPEC and, and output, is that of Iran. And Iran, obviously, now under sanctions. Once again, the Iranian oil minister has said very clearly that Iran does not want to cut back on its output, especially in, in a scenario where it is now back under sanctions. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of politics at play there as well with, with, with Iran and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, because we know that a Saudi official recently met Brian Hook, who is the, the U.S. official responsible for the sanctions on Iran. Again, a very uh, confusing scenario, if I may use that term, because they saw the overtures towards Russia, but at the same time they're meeting with this U.S. official who is sanctioning Iran. Uh, how, do you, how do you view that, that entire issue vis-a-vis -vis Iran? Well, I think, you know, the, in general, the, the Iran-Saudi issue is kind of the... Uh, the the big cloud hanging over the entire region. I mean, not even from the Gulf, right? We can think that to to Syria, Lebanon, uh, etc. Yeah. So, I mean, the Iranian factor ultimately plays into this, and I think in a number of of sort of complex uh, uh, ways, for sure. Um, Iranians not wanting to cut back on output at this point, of course, makes sense from their point of view, particularly being under sanctions. Uh, how that will impact the overall output of energy, I'm not sure. Uh, but it, I think it's important to keep in mind the, the Iranian factor, particularly in light of uh, this sort of overarching uh, regional rivalry between uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran. And again, there there's some sort of unprecedented uh, aspects of this because uh, OPEC, for example, uh, even during the uh, Iran-Iraq war, uh, we had, you know, we had Iraq and Iran at war with each other, and mm. at the same time, they were meeting in Vienna, uh, sitting around the table, OPEC, uh, you know, making decisions about uh, oil output. So mm. the fact that we have, we're witnessing as much discord uh, within these uh, multilateral bodies, whether it be OPEC or the GCC, uh, is is something that is, uh, is is needs to be taken note of. Okay, so now let's let's go now to the United States specifically because the U.S. president, uh, obviously Donald Trump, ever since he's come into office, has been on a war path with with many um, countries around the world, even allies, uh, and he's spoken out about OPEC many many times as a cartel, as as a group, as a mafia. Even I believe a word he's used at some point in time in the past, saying that they keep oil prices high artificially. Uh, do you think that there, there is some truth to that, that the U.S. president keeps going after OPEC? Um, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to put 
too much stock in uh, the, the words of the U.S. president these days, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, they seem to change sort of day by day. I mean, I think there's some historical truth to the fact that there have been times where OPEC has used its weight to uh, either inflate or deflate oil prices. Uh, when you're controlling that level of production and when you are able to find agreement amongst the, the producers that sit within this uh, organization, uh, definitely. I mean, they have the power to do that and, and, and they have, have done it. To his point that they are always keeping prices artificially high, I mean, clearly I think that's not, not, always, uh, mm. not always the case. Indeed. We're just going to take a very short break, Michael. We'll be back um, to discuss this further. Uh, viewers, do stay with us. We're, of course, going to continue to discuss the effects of Qatar's decision. Today, today's summit, OPEC summit, that is, in Vienna and Austria, and, of course, other related issues. Stay with us. Welcome back, viewers. We're continuing to discuss the situation surrounding Qatar leaving OPEC as well as the OPEC summit taking place in Vienna today. And I believe tomorrow as well there will be a meeting with the Russians and the Saudis at the very least. We're still joined by Michael Arnold, who is a deputy researcher at TRT World's Research Center. Uh, Michael, I wanted to continue with you and ask you, um, one of the arguments that I imagine the Saudis would put forth for, for possibly changing tact at this point in time regarding oil prices would be this, this very ambitious vision 2030, I believe it was, or 2020. Uh, I'm, a, I'm mistakenly forgetting which one it is, but um, that the MBS has spoken about, um, saying that obviously he wants to revamp the Saudi economy, et cetera, et cetera. He obviously needs money to be able to do that. It does make sense then from a Saudi point of view, doesn't it, Michael, that, that he would now be siding with, with ha wanting higher oil prices, looking more at national interests versus just appeasing the United States? Uh, yeah, on the surface, I think that, that makes some sense. And I think uh, for his, his Vision 2030 uh, program, as you said, he needs that sort of, you know, he needs capital. Obviously, he's seeking, uh, you know, foreign investment, uh, etc. But definitely, he will need to have, uh, you know, a, a set of, of, of money flowing in. Uh, and at this point, as much as they would like to transform their economy, that's still dependent on oil. Um, at the same time, I think, uh, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, I think it's 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 difficult to analyze uh, the Saudi position right now in light of how we would normally see sort of rational state behavior uh, to be, if we want to put it uh, want to put it that way. Um, and I think uh, to add to that as well, uh, the Saudis have have historically uh, sought to to balance uh, both the price of oil. Uh, as well as uh, you know, appeasing their their allies, and most particularly the United States, where of course that the relationship with Washington is the most important uh, one for the Saudis. It has been, and perhaps in some ways, at least under President uh, Trump and Mohammed bin Salman, is the most more important than it ever has been. So, do you think that um, the Saudis will side more with Russia now over America, or is that too much a, too, too much of an overstatement? I think it's it's a bit of a stretch. I think what we see the Saudis doing is is possibly hedging their bets. Uh, at this point, they still have the the administration for the most part, at least the White House, uh, definitely uh, politically on their side. Uh, there are splits within the Republican Party, in particular in the United States, about how to approach uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and this is the important caveat here is Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman. If you see the, the statement released uh, from the, I believe, six uh, senators uh, yesterday in re regards to both to Khashoggi, uh, regards to Yemen, uh, and regards to Qatar, uh, this was not sort of an indictment of America's strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia, but an indictment of uh, the direction of that relationship under the leadership of uh, the crown prince. Um, so in terms of Saudi Arabia under the crown prince's authority moving closer to Russia, while it remains a possibility, I think it's a relatively distant possibility and it, it, may, be, it may be some posturing or some hedging of bets more, more than anything at this point. But, you know, things are, uh, seem to be very fluid in the region these days, so it's, it's, it's possible, it's possible. All right, and you know one other aspect that comes up, and it's it's interesting. I was just reading an article yesterday, which mentioned that back in October, apparently, Mohammed bin Salman actually spoke 
um, quite positively about Qatar, um, saying that you know it's a country which, within the next five years, shows the most promise. And I believe he was speaking economically and just st stability-wise as well. Uh, do you think that, as many people have said in the past, I believe it was Adil Jaber who had said this in the past, or that this rift that we saw between Qatar and, and the other GCC members was a was a family rift, was a family disagreement. Uh, do you think the Qataris have done enough, in your reading, of course, uh, to, to try to come to a compromise, possibly, with these other quote-unquote family members? Do you think the Qataris maybe just uh, became a bit too stubborn, possibly? Well, I think the, uh, the characterization of it being a family dispute um, I understand where that comes from, but I think it's a bit of a uh, a bit of an overstatement. Uh, and it's, there's sort of two two perspectives here. One, if we look within the framework of the GCC, in many ways the GCC, at least up until the last two years, represented the most stable multilateral institution within the within the Arab world since its uh, formation. At the same time, it's very clear that. Uh, political trust between the various ruling families of the Gulf state, Gulf states uh, has never been particularly high. And so while they managed for, uh, I mean, really up until, we could say, 2015, to put on a sort of a common uh, foreign policy front or a common front regards to Iran, whatever it may be, at least publicly, uh, under the surface, there was a lot of, uh, you know, political distrust that uh, that was taking place, which is it shouldn't come as be particularly surprising. Um, in terms of Qatar uh, having responded to the uh, the, the critiques uh, emerging out of uh, particularly Saudi Arabia, but also also the the UAE and and some of their other partners in the Arab world. Uh, the blockade of Qatar, which of course uh, this revolves all around, um, represents, in my view, a complete and utter foreign policy failure of the, the, the Saudi-led blockading parties. I mean, if we look at just the reality on the ground there, is that Qatar did not make one move, one inch towards the, uh, the, the Saudi demands. And, and I think, you know, if we're, it's, it's, hopefully this doesn't sound too cynically, but the demands in the first place were, were never meant to be implemented. I mean, they were, they were so outrageous that even many of Saudi's allies, particularly in the West, uh, kind of took a second look at them and, and uh, didn't really understand where they were coming from or how they would realistic, realistically be, uh, be implemented. But with all the, uh, the events that have taken place uh, in the region since, uh, which have shed, cast a negative light, uh, rightly or wrongly, upon Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman. The, the, the negative casting is there, particularly uh, in, in, in international media, but also uh, within uh, multilateral institutions. Right. And Qatar has managed to cultivate a, uh, uh, a positive image of itself to the point that it is probably more trusted, particularly in the West now, than it was uh, bef before this crisis. All right, we're now joined by Mr. Gaurav Sharma, who is an independent oil market analyst and Forbes columnist. And he is, in fact, at the summit venue, the OPEC summit venue, I should say, in Vienna, in Austria. Gaurav, I know that you have a very busy schedule, so we really appreciate you taking your time out to join us here in the scope. And let's, let's get right into it, if we can, Gaurav. Um, obviously, as we know, the, one of the biggest news that came out in recent days leading up to this summit of OPEC in Vienna is that of Qatar leaving uh, the organization. What do you make of that? Good to, be, good to be on the program. You think that that has kind of dominated the headlines over the last two, three days. And I think if, if the Qataris wanted a, a sense of timing to send a message, then the timing couldn't have been better. Now, if you look at it in pure mathematical terms, Qatar contributes about one million barrels per day in terms of output to OPEC. That's including the condensates. So in barrel terms, it's not really a major oil exporter. It's rather more of an energy market leader. Now, Qatar's departure is as symbolic as, as it is about barrels. Now, essentially what they've said is they want to concentrate on LNG and the market should take that at face value, that it's not a political statement. But, you know, we analysts think it's, it's anything but. Right now, it looks like OPEC is not working for Qatar and they have decided to, uh, to go. And what that has basically done is it's created a bit of a fractious house uh, here at, at OPEC HQ in, uh, in Vienna. And that has sort of colored the vision uh, for the summit. 
Right. So, so because you are on the ground there, just, just tell us about what the, what the mood is like there. What's what's happening there itself? Because we also know that, that there is talk of the Saudis and the Russians possibly coming to some sort of a deal vis-a-vis uh, production, oil production, and, and whether there will be a cut or not. Well, in, in terms of Qatar, I think a lot of people have, have sort of shrugged it off. I think OPEC members have come and gone before in uh, in, in past history. Indonesia has been uh, uh, in OPEC on, off and on. But what is key here is that this is the first time in OPEC's history that a Middle Eastern member has actually decided to quit uh, and, and it's been a member since 1961. So that, that, that's going to count. Now, another thing is that the, the Saudi-Russian cooperation, at least on paper, appears to be uh, at its best. I think the, uh, my forecast is, or my prediction is, uh, you can never be sure of these things, but I think I'm expecting a cut of about 1.1 to 1.4 million barrels per day, depending on, on, on where we see. I think, I think about at least a cut over a million is about par. And a lot of that is down to Saudi-Russian cooperation. Mm. But the issue here is, is not their cooperation, but rather their cooperation is, is kind of you know, upsetting the, the other members, if I may use the, use the phrase. Indeed, and we, we had um, the Saudi oil minister, I believe it was, who met um, the U.S. official in, in who is responsible, I, I believe Brian, Brian Hook is his name, who is responsible for the sanctions on Iran. Uh, Iran, of course, is an important player in OPEC as well. Uh, what do you make of that situation? I think the international diplomacy right now is very, very complicated. More, none more complicated than the fact that the president uh, of the United States is, is quite uh, quite keen on sending uh, his messages via Twitter, so his diplomacy by by Twitter, and how how that factors into the thinking of the oil markets is is, uh, is very problematic. Uh, if OPEC cuts, it would be in direct contravention to what President Trump said on on, on Twitter yesterday, which is whether he wants OPEC to keep the the taps open. Yeah. Now, how how this factor is in is, is not really sure. Now, if you look at where the oil price is right now, is what, what the, the kind of trading uh, we're seeing in Asia, which is the, 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 uh, the market bearer right now until Europe comes online. Uh, if you look at the oil price where it is, if you look at Brent, it's somewhere around $61, uh, $61 plus mark. Uh, and it's been here and there. And that's because a lot of these traders are looking at what's going on and they're not pricing in a possible OPEC cut. And that is what is making the situation very tricky. The market is saying, well, you know what, let's wait for OPEC to say something. Uh, whereas in past cases, you know, often if a cut is, is really on the horizon, you will see traders responding immediately. So the oil price is kind of down. And I think we're, we're stuck in this sort of 60s range uh, until we see a clear, uh, a clear we, until we get a clear message from OPEC. And a, fi a final question before I let you go, Gaurav. Um, do you think that many people are saying that, that OPEC really needs to reform itself, that um, what many people would call the Saudi mono monopoly on decision-making OPEC needs to change? Uh, the many factors, of course, I'm just bringing up some examples. Do you think that OPEC as an organization can reform itself so that it remains you know, going to the future strong? I think never say never. I think they need to reform themselves for the simple reason. Look, if you take OPEC out of the equation, you just take three countries, that be Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. All these three countries put together are producing more oil than all of OPEC put together. Of course, Saudi Arabia is an OPEC member. Now, take that dynamic and then you know, sort of extrapolate to the situation that OPEC is facing. It's, it's, it's got internal divisions, it's got fractions and so on. So yes, it's got to reform itself. Another thing, apart from reform, it's got to keep itself relevant. So, so that is the other challenge that they're grappling with. And I think, uh, I think this is something that they have to respond to. Uh, having said so, Qatar's departure has uh, you know, thrown a spanner in the works. We appreciate all of our guests and all the insight they've provided us. Obviously, quite a complex situation when it comes to uh, Qatar walking away from OPEC. Uh, it may have just made sense for it, of course, for it to concentrate on its uh, natural gas instead of its, uh, its, its oil output, which in context to other OPEC members was, was fairly low. But um, we'll, of course, have to see what this GCC summit coming forward means for Qatar as well. That very important invitation going out by the Saudi king to the Qatari emir. We'll see how the Qataris respond to that specific situation as well. That is something that we'll keep a very close eye on here in The Scope. Thanks very much for watching. I've been Wakar Rizvi.